There are seven and a half billion people who are now living on the planet Earth. By the way, 21% of those live in China. Think about that. Seven and a half billion people and 21% of them live in China. Now, you know how many of those 7.5 billion people have cell phones? Five billion. That's a market, huh? That's a market. Now, how many of those have the expectation that their phones come with a certain amount of privacy, a certain amount of uh, security, you think? Just about all, right? It looks like a naval radar scanning for enemy ships. The Deadbeat map is an add-on to the Chinese social media platform WeChat. It allows users to pinpoint the location of those who have failed to pay their debts within a 500 meter radius. This naming and shaming app essentially uh, is China's latest tool to monitor the behavior of its citizens and to pretty much distinguish between those who are trustworthy and those who are disobedient. It's pretty terrifying. Tell us more about this app. Well, as you mentioned, this is part of China's social credit system, which is reportedly uh, going to be mandatory by 2020. Be so happy that they won't protest. They will never right. criticize the government and all that sort of stuff. But the trade-off is your privacy. Yes. You know, maybe that's maybe that's a gamble that's worth it. Mm -hmm. Maybe people really don't appreciate their privacy all that much. I mean, look at us here, right? Yeah. We've been handing over our privacy to private companies mm -hmm. for years now. So, I mean, is that likely to work? Do people not care that much about their privacy? Well, listen, if people here are willing to hand over all of our privacy, all, most, much of our privacy, in exchange for commercial and material <laughs> efficiency, right. what's to say that 1.4 billion people That's in right. China wouldn't give over their privacy for governing efficiency? So when we talk about how, it, how China is trying to become an AI superpower in the 21st century, that's about controlling an industry that has global implications. I want to ask you about quantum computing because you had a big announcement about IBM putting forth the first system to work on quantum. Now, actually having full-blown quantum computing for business still years away, but this is an important milestone and IBM has been doing more work on this than most other companies, arguably any other company. Anyway. It's not just that knowledge is growing, but it's begun to grow at a rate unparalleled in the history of the world. So that knowledge doubles once every 100 years until 1950 or World War II, while knowledge began to double every 25 years. And then today we say the doubling of knowledge in the world happens every 13 months. But if you think that's a lot to swallow, the greatest challenge that we face today with this increase of knowledge and information is how to manage and use an ever-sized mountain of data. Now tell us, what is quantum computing? Well, very few, very few people know that we are reaching the point where we can no longer make faster computers using the technology that we're using today. This year, IBM began to help us take that first step in producing the first commercially viable quantum computer. Now, what is a quantum computer? Well, I don't know what's going to cost. They just profiled it just about a month ago, and it's an amazing 20 by 20 box. But the fact is, it's going to be probably in the range of billions of dollars. But the value of this piece of equipment, which is so necessary, is its ability to basically atomically process information rather than rely upon silicon chip based computers. Uh, guys, what will quantum computing help us do that we cannot do today? Well, basically what we will be able to do is operations that today take us, let's say, hours or days, we can do it in a blink of a second. It's, it has the ability to take massive amounts of data and crunch them and, and sort them according to the algorithms that are written to get the information that you want. So that for the first time we have a computer-based uh, system that can actually process all the data that needs to be able to be processed for this kind of system to come into place. We're going to basically 
uh, lay out the needed steps for organizations, government, NGOs, IBM whatever. Security has invested uh, independent research and development. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. IBM, well, we'll, Google, Microsoft, everybody's there after the technology. Well, we look forward to following this as it evolves. Uh, now, not only is the quantum thousands of times faster than a silicone-based computer, but it's absolutely necessary for creating the Internet of Things. Since the birth of sewing and weaving, technology has always led developments in fashion. The Industrial Revolution mechanized manufacturing, enabling mass production. In the 1960s, synthetic materials like polyester took off, creating new possibilities for fashion. Now, the convergence of new technologies is opening up previously unimaginable possibilities. And when the Internet of Things becomes online, and what that means is that everything in your world will have a radio frequency ID or a chip in it. The convergence of fashion and technology also provides opportunities to transform not just clothes, but the people wearing them. Myant is a company that's pioneering the creation of clothing that can monitor your every move. We call it textile computing. Uh, some other people call it uh, smart fabric. I mean, we're talking about every piece of clothing you're wearing will have a small chip in it so that if we find a shirt on the street, we can, just like some people brought my dog back once, I thought that was the worst thing I ever did, was put a chip in that thing. But put the... <laughs> Run, Forrest, run! <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but it's hard for us to imagine, but everything will have these very inexpensive chips put in them so that the manufacturer, the owner, and everything, the time of bought, uh, everything about it will be known and will be traceable. Essentially, it's, a, it's an interactive fabric that could uh, sense uh, data from you. So-called smart fabrics are being touted as the next frontier of wearable technology. Yarns are paired with electronic sensors so that essential data can be captured from the human body. Smart fabrics could radically change consumers' relationships with the clothes they wear. But as technology increases the pace of change, how can the industry keep track of what consumers really want? But when this comes online, you know what they say? That the rate of knowledge increase will double every 12 hours. We are just seeing a pace of change which is frightening, but it's also incredibly exciting for the future of fashion. To keep up, the industry is also turning to technology. We are for sure in the midst of a digital revolution. AI, the idea of kind of machine learning and big data, how do we start to sort of synthesize all of these new technologies and start to make sense of All of this is leading to the development of far more complex algorithms. And basically, what an algorithm does is it places a value on certain pieces of information and discards the things that aren't value. So like when the Chinese are doing today with their social credit score. I mean, we're pointing to China, but here too, there's a sort of black mirror effect. Uh, we all have a financial credit score and more and more we're asked to grade, you know, our Uber drivers, but also our Airbnb hosts. So it is something essentially that's coming into our society uh, slowly but surely. And here the state is already using data in an effort to control the behavior of its citizens. Journalist Leo Hu is barred from some hotels. He can't buy property. He can't even take a high-speed train. The government here is building a social credit system using individuals' data. The Chinese government wants this social credit system to monitor the trustworthiness of its 1.4 billion citizens and to monitor their compliance with social norms and rules.
This could eventually include close surveillance of their activities, both online and in the wider world. In Western democracies, checks and balances could prevent the kind of exploitation some in China are already facing. But will they? I think it's interesting that the Chinese people care more about safety than freedom. And essentially throughout history, people have over and over again given up their, their freedom in order to feel more safe. It's part of the secret of the Nazis in Europe. This is the kind of thing that guys like Stalin and Hitler would have, you know, sold everyone's firstborn child to have. <laughs> because it's ability to absolutely control, absolute surveillance 24-7. And so people sit back, how in the world can the Antichrist control the world economy? It's very simple. When you realize that China now, I mean India, has requires 1.3 billion people to have biometric cards, biometric cards in order to engage in the system. They cannot buy or sell or travel or anything else without having their card. And you realize on the other end, you've got China with 1.2 billion people. We're getting close to half the world's population is already part of this kind of surveillance system. And it's reaching all over. Somebody just sent me an article uh, the other day where Venezuela now is working with ZTE, one of these Chinese companies developing this technology because Maduro in, China, in Venezuela would like to have that kind of control over his population basically without the biometric card. You can't buy or sell in Venezuela. Venezuela. It's happening all around us and we have it. We just don't have a despotic government. Well, maybe I should rethink that. We don't have the same level of despotism in our country that exists in other countries. But if the history of the world is, is true and it, it always tends to be, it's just a matter of time. We've never had a, a weapon that we haven't used. We've never had a technology that we haven't used. And we've used them for good things and we've used them for some nefarious things. And it's coming. With the help of artificial intelligence, engineers have created a system that translates thoughts into actual speech. Now the advancement is giving new hope to people who have lost their ability to speak. Neuroengineers out of the University of Columbia have created a breakthrough device that uses machine learning neuro networks to translate brain activity into actual speech. Many are saying this could be life changing. And in fact, again, I'm not just pulling this out of conjecture. A recent article by the uh, Australian Broadband that uh, basically they have a news magazine, they talk about technology. According to the Future Business of Australia 2014, 2040 report, they said most workers are predicted to have embedded personal technology within 18 years. But they go on and say many activities may even be possible simply through mind control. They're talking about neurological biometrics where they put things in, in you that can actually read your thoughts. The vast majority of our employees absolutely love the conveniences that having this chip in their hand really brings. I can log into my computer with this, which I do every day. Uh, I can log into my phone with it. Uh, uh, I can pay for items if I forgot my credit card or my phone. Uh, I can log into work. Uh, this is the actual size of the chip. I don't know if you can see that, but it is the size of a grain of rice, literally that can draw from the cloud, which can store an unlimited amount of data, and it's going to be transmitted to us on 5G networks. 5G technology is being sold as the future. It will let you surf the web and download content faster than ever. But there's just one problem. Scientists and medical professionals are petitioning against a 5G network rollout. We all want faster cell phone service, and the race is on for 5G, but it comes at a cost. A 30-foot cell phone tower coming soon to a neighborhood near you. And we'll be seeing a lot of these shorter 30-foot towers go up. This one is already up in Denver. Let's listen to what Dr. Sharon Goldberg has to say. She's a clinical researcher and an internal medicine physician. This is what she has to say about what we're using today. Wireless radiation has biological effects, period. This is no longer a subject for debate when you look at PubMed and the peer-reviewed literature. These effects are seen in all life forms, plants, animals, insects, microbes. In humans, we have clear evidence of cancer now. There is no question. Um, we have evidence of DNA damage, 
cardiomyopathy, which is the precursor of congestive heart failure. Neuropsychiatric effects. Well, a few days ago, actually, a group of scientists, doctors, environmental organizers, and concerned citizens got together and they called for the urgent stop to the deployment of 5G. They mm. said that it's been proven harmful to human bodies, that this is an experiment on humanity, mm. and that this should be called a crime under international law. And this is the attraction to 5G. It means uninterrupted, un constant flow of data at levels that are hundreds, if not thousands of times, greater than you can get from your uh, ordinary cell tower today. This is a great big beautiful tomorrow. Because I mean, I'm, I'm so tired of having to wait. <laughs> but the final replacement is going to happen when we fully go over to, away from hard currency to digital currency. Is Canada going cashless? Some interesting data points in in a survey in today's Globe and Mail about uh, the number of Canadians choosing to just use plastic or contactless payments through mobile apps. 63 percent, they never carry cash. Do you know, only 8 percent of currency actually exists in a physical form. 92 to 93 percent of all currency is digital already. But you see, this requires digital devices. And currently, today, there are 10 billion, 10 billion with a B, 10 billion digital devices on planet Earth. Wow, impressive. By 2020, next year, there will be between 50 and 60 billion digital devices on the planet. And by the year 2030, 99% of all things on the planet will be connected to the internet. 99%, not just devices, 99% of stuff. And of course, there's another concern, which is that subtle psychological messaging that this technology, that use of this technology gives us, especially to kids, um, that to gain access to knowledge or money because there are payment systems that use biometric identifiers, food, travel, any sort of item or activity, you have to hand over your privacy. So what we're really seeing is the normalization of a cashless society and the normalization of the extinction of privacy. All this information is gathered up and they just simply have to write the algorithm that they need to sort the data and they have the quantum community, com computing which can do it fast enough so that instantaneously information about you can be grasped. Now. The question is, okay, great theory, but where is this practically being paid, played out? Roll the video. <laughs> In addition to the U.S., there are numerous countries with some sort of biometric identification grid that I know of. Let's take a look at this list of countries. This is an extensive list, and this is the only, only the countries that I was able to find today. Hmm. So this is everything from passports, border security systems, some other form of ID cards. And what we're really seeing is that we are handing over our biological information, knowledge about our physical characteristics, to these state actors. Leaders from various industries around the world have gathered in Davos, Switzerland for the 2019 World Economic Forum, where artificial intelligence is a top subject of discussion. Since 2015, Sophia stepped onto the celebrity stage, gracing magazine covers, singing with Jimmy Fallon. See something I'm giving up on you. Even going on a date with Will Smith. Let's hang out and get to know each other for a little while. In 2017, she's addressed the United Nations. I am thrilled and honored to be here. And already had a Twitter feud with Chrissy Teigen. Guess who came to support us at Lip Sync Battle Live? But don't worry, they're friends now. Oh my gosh! But importantly, I think, along these same lines is, there's never been another point in human history that we can look at where the literal fulfillment of these things could actually take place. You see, throughout history, people have been trying to look at these words and, and understand these symbols and these actions and these personalities, and they tend to, as we often do, identify it with what's going on in our personal generation. I mean, in World War II, the vast majority of evangelical Christians who believed in the literal fulfillment of biblical prophecy were absolutely convinced that it was Adolf Hitler, and for good reason. <laughs> He really seemed to fit all of that. And one of the things that I pointed out earlier was that the spirit of Antichrist has been with us since the fall. But never before in human history has this been 
able to be fulfilled in the literal sense in which the Bible speaks of it. And what happened even historically is the church began to, especially after the pattern or example of Augustine in the fifth century, began to interpret it allegorically. And the problem with allegory, allegor, allegorical interpretations is your allegory is good as mine. <laughs> In other words, every generation could, kind of like the book of your rancho or something like that, you, could, or you can find yourself in any of these things because the prophecies are so vague and far flung, they mean nothing. And so once you disconnect the prophecy from historical reality in the future and give it something other than a very literal meaning, you will be free to give it any meaning you want. Yet today is different because today we can look at it in its most literal meaning and we can see the possibility of its fulfillment in the world in which we live. And the idea of, of one universal economy where nobody can buy or sell without being part of it has never been a reality until the day in which we're living today. In fact, it's, it's, it's almost like a tsunami of information and, and knowledge that has so hit us in our day and age, it's changed everything. Uh, it's almost like having a nuclear weapon without a way of delivering it. The only thing it would be good for is blowing yourself up. And so you have to have a delivery system, and Satan has to have a delivery system for this universal world income or economy. And today we're in that kind of world where there's an all-encompassing universal system that is even operating as we speak. Daniel tells us, in fact, in Daniel chapter 12, he tells us that one of the signs of the time of the end, as he referred to it, would be when knowledge shall increase. And it's interesting because it's the word increase is in what's called the imperfect mood, and what it means is to increase exponentially. It's not just that knowledge is growing, but it's begun to grow at a rate unparalleled in the history.